Like our next case. guest played and coached baseball at BYU. He was a, on the hot corner at third base. Just finished a full season officiating college basketball, including the big dance. It's our pleasure to welcome back our friend Mike Littlewood to the Wise Guys. Usually when we hang out, we're eating lunch. <laughs> but tonight we're talking about we're talking about you. Welcome. It's great to great to be here. And you're right. We haven't seen each other in a while. And uh Dave, I thought there was going to be food here. That's why I came. Because <laughs> yeah. every time it's we gonna, eat, it's for lunch. We should have a steak salad here at exactly. some point. I apologize for that. <laughs> now, we hear from players and coaches all the time about uh, how important it is to play in the big dance, to reach it and take the floor and feel the magic. What's it like for an official? It's the same. Really? It's the same thing. There's, you know, I've, been, I've coached a lot of what I think are really big baseball games and went yeah. to a regional and, um, but on the officiating side, there's nothing that I've ever experienced in athletics. That's as special as March madness. The, just the feeling. And I've, I've worked a couple elite eights, which are regional yeah. finals and, and uh, two or three sweet 16s, which are regionals. And before my first regional, I literally didn't think I could blow my whistle. I was just like, Ugh. out of air. You're just mouth dry and <laughs> you couldn't like, get yeah, a breath. Hyperventilating. You're like, can I do this? Can I do this? And then um, the first time they took it down the court, walking Noah stuck his elbow into somebody's throat, and I had a foul. And I'm like, my whistle works, my my breath works, my throat works. I can do this, but it's uh, you know they take a hundred guys, hundred referees to, to work March Madness. And out of how many? I don't even know. There's, There's got to be a bazillion. How, yeah. how do you get four or five hundred in the in the country? Yeah. The, the how do you get selected? Level. Like, what's the process? Do you, like, you're evaluated every single every single game, every single play you do. We're we're evaluated probably by two or three different people every single game we work, especially in the Power Five conferences uh, or, or the Mountain West and uh, Mountain West West Coast. Yeah. Uh, PAC, the the bigger ones that I work, you're getting evaluated by an evaluator, and they put your yeah, I did that when I was at BYU, coaching at BYU. Right. I would actually grade games out. So there's a lot of scrutiny. Uh, and then ultimately, there's the NCAA committee, selection committee, and Chris Rastetter, who's the uh, coordinator of officials. And they just, they give you, a, well, they'll send you an email on the first one. They'll give you calls after that. So I did not get a call after the first round. Nice. After, so after a game, they go to the coaches and teams go to their locker rooms. You guys go to yours. Uh, how soon are you critiqued on how you did? Um, well, if you screw something up, you're critiqued pretty, <laughs> pretty immediately. Um, like, do you hear about it in the locker room afterwards? Oh, if, yeah, yeah. I had a couple games this year that that uh, didn't go the way we wanted them, and we heard about it in the locker room right yeah. away, either by text by a supervisor, or, and you, you never want those. But um, just normally, you'll get your evaluation probably a week later, and it's got a percentage there for you. It's got calls you, so you're graded on no calls incorrect, calls incorrect, correct calls, no calls <coughs> correct. So. If I'm driving the ball to you and you wall up with verticality and I bang into you and there's a no call, I should get credit for that by, by making a tough no call. And so there's a lot of things that like your normal fan wouldn't appreciate that because there's decisions to make every single time down the court. You could call foul every time, couldn't you? Oh, yeah, you could call fouls uh, all the time, but we call them interrupters. You know, does, it, does this foul, is it going to help the game? Or is it just going to interrupt the game and slow it down and chop it up? And nobody, nobody wants to and, do and that. Do you keep in mind? Does this and does this foul have an impact on the like? Does does the defender get an advantage by what he just did? And st and that you take that into account as well, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. We do. It's for us. It's called like a rebound. You get the rebound. I come over your back. I bang you a little bit, but you come down with the ball and you don't lose your balance. It's there's no possession consequence there, and so you kind of just let that go. Now, if you if you bang them hard, you have to make that you know that decision whether it's hard enough to call a foul or not. But um, usually, guys rebound or big guys, you want to keep those guys in the game. You don't want cheap fouls on them, and and so you try not to call fouls on big guys early. Former BYU baseball head coach and current college basketball official Mike Littlewood is on the Wise Guys on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and wiseguys.com. Now, here comes the question we've been just dying to ask you. Oh, you. Uh, we've been talking about this ever since we knew you were I coming. I think I've out. heard this. Uh, it seemed to us that tournament games are so much more physical than regular season games. And it doesn't matter which one. I mean, BYU got banged up against uh, Duquesne, but... But even the games the other day, it just seems like what is a foul in the regular season is suddenly not in the postseason. And so we were wondering, as officials, are you guys said, hey, are you told, guys, let the game, let the game go and let the, let the game be itself and don't 
interfere with it? Uh, do, do you guys or swallow your whistle is another thing that we talk. How do yeah. you approach a tournament game from a regular season game? Well, I think I think they're the same. I would hope they're the same. Um, and and I I think the physicality of, of tournament games are just the nature of what's on the line. I mean, everybody's and you, and you're seeing it, it's so much easier to, to referee two very very talented teams that are physical. Um, some of the lower level leagues are much harder to referee because the guys might might not be in such a control. But the I mean, you get. Uh, BYU Duquesne, they're, they're super athletic, they're super physical, and they can get away with a little bit more physicality. And yeah, we, just what we talked about, you don't want to put cheap fouls in games like that, where they're just, where you're, you have 50 fouls and you're shooting 40 free throws each. Uh, so I would hope it's the same. Um, and we all have our philosophy, we're taught, we're taught the philosophy about 10-1-4 or, or freedom of movement and verticality plays and pathway plays and last, uh, um, plant foot plays and all these things that Again, the regular fan doesn't know about, but we, we definitely have a philosophy on how we're calling certain plays to get us on the same page. Now, whether your judgment's the same as our, you know, us three or a crew, our judgment might be different. But to answer your question, we're definitely not swallow the whistle, but let them play. It's, it's interesting because I had a game, I won't mention the teams, but we let them play a little bit. And this was a, this was a pretty good game, pretty competitive game that, that meant something at the end of the season. And... We did shoot some free throws, but for the most part, we let them play a little bit. And one of the players, one of the better players, came up to me and patted me on the rear end. And he said, hey, thanks for letting us play tonight. This was late in the game. And I'm like, that's what they want. Yeah. Uh, didn't yeah. get much pushback from coaches. And so that's kind of what they want if we, if we can do that. If you can let them play and it's not to an advantage to one team or another, that's what you want, right? Yeah, 100%. We, we, I, it'd be great to have no fouls in the game and let them play and just watch them shoot baskets and in fact most pre-games that I have with captains is like hey put the ball in the basket and this is going to be good for everybody but when they're missing shots and rebounding and uh, it's just tough it makes it tough we, we called a game where there were how many fouls was it 70 fouls it was something crazy oh my and, gosh. And, and I I literally after the game I was not I was like it might have been a women's basketball yeah I think game. it was and, and Somebody said, "What'd you think of the game?" And I said, "Right now, I want to kill myself. Like, I, that's, this is the worst." There thing wasn't I've a ever, game. A game didn't break out. This is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life, and I'm not going to mince words about it. Right? Yeah. It's it's no fun for you as an official if it kind of gets out of hand and it's sloppy, and they really are fouling. It's affecting the play, and you have to call it. That's not fun for you guys either, right? It, it's really not. Um, in fact, you're going, "Oh, geez, another foul." <laughs> you know, can you just please not? And then you try to talk him out of it. You'll see referees on the baseline take their whistle out of their mouth and say straight up or, or get off him or out yeah. top you'll say no hands you'll try to just preventative officiate a little bit but a lot of times they just they don't want to listen or they're just so caught up in the moment that when you try to go by me I'm going to stick my hand out and, and cause you to and bump you a little bit and that's a foul you know any any day of the week that's a foul so yeah it, it does make it tough I was going to ask you if this is the thing or not and this is a very reputable coach that's coached in the old Mountain West when when you and I were working that league together mm -hmm. a bunch and then when we see each other in Ruston, Louisiana, yeah, we see each other all over the place. Like, 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 hey, there's Blaine. Yeah, Mike and I, and you weren't you weren't calling any BYU games at that mm -hmm. time, but we were both kind of all over that league, and you yeah. and I would see each other all the time, which was yeah, really just random fun. places. It's good to run into your old BYU BYU guys, yeah, right? Yeah. But, so, coach said to me one time, especially when we're at home. We teach our guys to come out and be super super aggressive, maybe even a little handsy. Um, and because we almost want to change the barometer of the game, we want to be so aggressive at the beginning that the officials have to think, "Oh man, are we going to call something on every single time down the floor, or are we going to let this go?" And then what we do is, if they call us for two or three right in a row, then we know, okay, we got to back off a little bit. If if they let us get away with that, um, then that's good. We reset the barometer. Is that a thing? I think it is. And and as officials, we talk about that. And there's some games you'll go out and. You throw the ball up, and then it's like, whoa, this is okay. Game on. This is they're ready to go, and then you kind of like heighten, you know, just heighten your awareness a little bit. And there's some games that just kind of they flow, and everything's good. It's almost like a scrimmage, and everything's good. But I, I think a lot of coaches go with that philosophy, especially on certain things like screening, right? Um, and that's probably the biggest one. Hey, let's let's just move a little bit, get a little bit wider than we should, and see if they'll call it. Let's put the impetus on th those guys. See if they'll blow the whistle or not, and if we can get away with it. Because if they don't call a couple, now they've set the bar right there. Yeah, they can't. You can't call the fourth one that was the same as a, as the first three because that's not going to be consistent. So, yeah, I think you're right on. In that BYU Duquesne game, one of the things that that I noticed as we were watching it was how aggressive Duquesne. You know, you talk about screening. 
playing over the top of the screen. So they're coming on BYU shooters and they're trying to get over the top of the screen. And they're literally like throwing both arms in between the screener mm-hmm. and the defender, knocking the, or, or the, the guy with the ball, knocking the guy off the screen. And I'm thinking, man, those all look like fouls to me. Of course, I'm rooting for BYU. I'm not calling yeah. the game. When I'm calling the game, I don't really think about that. Yeah. When I'm rooting for BYU, I'm like, man, they're sure being physical. Those are the, some of the toughest plays to call. And there and there are two referee plays, so you'll you'll know there's a guy out top trail or, or center. Center is always across from the free throw line, and he's mm-hmm. alone on the side of the court. Well, those those picks up there, they have to be refereed by two people. One one referee has to take the screen, one referee has to take the dribbler, and the guy if he's especially if he's playing up top, like going through the top of it, it's a really really tough play because you got to look at the screener, you got to look at the guy who's making contact. Is he bumping the dribbler? Is a dribbler throwing his elbow? There's a lot going on in those plays. Yeah. It sounds like, um, you know, a team has to be on the same page to run their offense. And you can tell when they're not on the same page. Uh, is it the same for the, your crew of three where, where you might go, hey, we're everyone's <laughs> improv tonight, uh, as opposed to, and often you're in charge of your crew on the floor. And how do you, how do you get them all on the same page? Yeah, th- that's so interesting you say that because there is a crew chemistry. You know, culture has talked a lot about in, in teams. Yeah. You know, and I, I think culture is one of those things we can't define. And, you, you know, it's, you just know it's there or not. And, and I think that's the same with officiating. You'll, have, you'll, you'll be going through a game, and you'll be three minutes into it, and you'll hear a whistle, and you're like, what just happened? You know, th- that whistle didn't even fit this game. It, whether it was a foul or not or whatever, it just doesn't fit right now. And then you kind of like, you'll have talks at, at timeouts. You go and, hey, what would you see on that play? And the nice thing about the Division One level that's different from maybe the high school or J- JC level where you're, you're only working with the same guys all the time, so you kind of have to be nicer. You, we're honest with each other. We'll say, no, nah, there was no contact there, or it was – where a guy might have called a shooting foul, like, no, nah, that, that was a pass. It was a no call. And do they get mad and huffy? No, a lot of guys will try to just, they're like, fight for their call sure. or justify what they, well, I wasn't looking there. I was looking up here or whatever. It's like, okay, we'll look at the tape after. Because we can go on DV Sport and look at halftime at plays, and we do that. So you, you'll get immediate feedback where when I refereed before, I took the 10 years off, it was like the, the, the DVD, or not the DVD, not even DVDs. VHS. Yeah. VHS. Yeah. VHS. <laughs> We're rolling it back and trying to find the right spot. But right now, it's go to the play and find it. So what about also, I think, another point of frustration for fans, because they, might, they might not understand what you, what you guys are doing. When you go to a video review, and let's say there's a bunch of them in the game, mm-hmm. where it's just, and it just takes too long. Um, is there a clock in your head of like, hey, look, we... We can't be we can't be over here for five minutes. And there were some of those in the tournament at various spots yeah. where you can feel the fans groaning <laughs> while you're looking at a video. What what is that moment like? That's one thing we say is we don't want to spend uh, you know a lifetime over there, but we we want to make sure we get it right. Yeah. And and so a lot of times it's so interesting because a lot of times you're doing the you guys are doing TV and you'll say oh yeah I tipped it out. You'll get this look from your producer or whoever's giving you those looks. And you'll get that immediately because you have everybody in the truck going, hey, look at this angle. It's off his feet. Every, every person on tape goes, hey, I got to look. I got one okay, right here. And yeah. then, they, then they forward that one to us, right? And we're going through however many angles DV Sport has, and we're toggling ourselves because we want to. And so we'll touch screen it like, give me A look, B look. And some, in the NCAA tournament, they have 12 looks. And so if you're not sure, you can't walk away from there th- making a decision. and not. So we'll always go, hey, what does TV have? And a lot of times you'll see somebody run over to the TV crew and say, what do you guys have? And what angle are you, are you looking at? And then we'll run back and go, so, and, and especially under two minutes, because under two minutes, you can review everything. Yeah. So you're not going to have an out-of-bounds call in a close game and not review it, because, right. I mean, you'll just get vilified if you, like, you will. It's just, if you miss it and you can go check it, it just gives you the opportunity to get everything 100% right. So, yeah, it slows down the game, but the percentage of correct calls goes way up. <clears throat> well, and I'm always surprised at how the percent that, do you actually get the call right on the floor? It's amazing to me. Ones where it's just like, bam, bam, and you're going, and they make a call, and then you go review it, and the call is right. Sure, you overturn some, but are you surprised at the percentage that are right on the floor? It's amazing because the correct calls, like when you when you blow actually blow your whistle, college officials are, are right around 90, above 97%. That's, correct. The, which I, that's amazing yeah. to me. Um, now, it's when you get into your no calls, where you're letting plays go and and there might be a reason you're letting plays go that you know this play just doesn't fit or whatever it is or it's a flop and everybody thinks it's a should be a charge or a block right right. 
and but you don't want to put a flop in the game because it just doesn't fit this game. It does, you know, it doesn't fit the piece of the puzzle. And so there's so much more that goes into it than simply that's a foul, that's a foul, or, or that's not right. a foul. So right, there's nothing that drives a baseball fan more nuts or a batter probably even more so than the fan is if the strike zone changes over the course of a game. <laughs> yeah. And you've had plenty of those with home plate umpires when you're on the other side as as the manager head coach going, "Hey, that was a that was a ball in the 3rd inning. <laughs> yeah. How can it be a strike in the 8th inning?" because your pitcher's on the hill going, "Well, now I don't even know what I'm doing." Yeah. That is. I mean, that's a big thing, consistency throughout the game, and that's what you hear from a lot of times from the from the coaching that you know, it's not it's the little league thing to say is call them both ways. Um, but being consistent on both ends of the court, calling, calling your freedom of movements, calling your verticality plays all the same. So when you get one that's weird and out of, out of whack, everybody knows it. If, so if, if a coach, if you're over by a coach and a coach says, Mike, like we've been doing that all game, like you guys have been letting us get away with that all game long, and now you just called that. Like that's so out of – the. Do you acknowledge that? Like, how oh yeah, I, you know, everybody communicates in their own different way. And for me, and I have a little bit of credibility just because I've been doing it so long, and the tournament gives you. Credibility. You have a lot of credibility. Yeah. And so when you talk, I I would say a lot of young guys just nod your head, and that's the if we're going to a to a tough coach, and I have a younger guy with me, I'll just say just nod your head, or communicate how you want, but don't get yourself in trouble by your words. But I'll just go which specific play. So they they don't want to talk like that. Yeah, they, they, don't they don't want to get in the conversation. Yeah. So I'll say, no, which particular? I can't remember which particular play. What, but if I do know, I'll say, yeah, we probably missed that one. And I think that's showing a little bit of humility. Where he goes, what can he say about that? I will say that a lot of guys will say, well, then just get him right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> most okay, guys we're trying. We're trying, right? Yeah. Most guys know that you're not going to be perfect. NCAA college basketball official Mike Littlewood's on the Wise Guys tonight. We're so happy to, one, we're happy we're friends. Yeah. <laughs> and then we're happy to be able to talk about this stuff. The college basketball season's long. The teams play 35 games. How many did you ref this year? Yeah, I, bet, I better not say the number, but it was a lot. Yeah, my legs are telling me to, to shut it down. So. What is the typical Wait, do you do more than season? David Hall used to in his peak? Um, Dave, no. Because no. I used to say to Dave, where are you this week? Well, I'm here, here. I said, are you doing four games this week? Is that even possible? No, I'm doing five, Blaine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, okay. I'll tell you a lot of, you know, now that it's my, my main, my main job without coaching, I've never had that before. When I, when I coached 50 ish was, was a good number for me. And so not coaching, you can kind of tell where that number. And, and when you were at Dixie, you could still go do college. Yeah. Games. Yeah. yeah. Dixie, right. I could do that was part of the deal. Um, but obviously at BYU, this way right. too much um I, I wouldn't even want to do that um so how many a week give or take oh, I, on average four or five four or five yeah four or five um but there's a point where at, at my age you don't want to you know you don't want to just blow it out in one year and, and try to go do as many games you can and um you kind of just have to pace your because the legs are i mean you have one set of legs yeah and uh there's well then there's the head yeah i mean yeah. You're, if you're in your fifth city of, in a week and it's the second half, and it's crunch time. Yeah, and you're, you know, you're when, somewhere when I else. I used to do two games a week. I'd wake up in the middle of the night <laughs> in the hotel, and I would sit up, and I'd go, "Where are we? Which which way's the bathroom? <laughs> I don't even know what hotel I'm in. What's it in my? I, I don't can't know, I tell you. Five. I can't tell you how many times like I would go to the hotel, and everybody has a a routine, right? I mean, you take the earliest flight, so you're up at four a.m. You take the six a.m. flight, you get to your next city at nine a.m. Try to sleep a little bit. Try to you know just. I've got a routine when I get in. I turn on the TV, uh, I iron, I do, and I put my clothes away. I have to do that. And then I'll probably go lift or just fake like I'm lifting down there a little bit. No, this man could lift. And, believe me. And so I've worked out with him. And, you know, and everybody has their routine that way. And if you get out of your routine, but, you know, there's, I, I had a stretch where I did probably 11 out of 12 days this year. Oh, wow. And it was zigzag, you know, and, and it was, and, but it's, it's kind of like it, it took me back to pro baseball. You, your body just gets ready again. I don't know how it does, but when the ball goes up or when the first pitch is thrown, your body just is ready to go. And it's amazing how the body works. And you can get your rest where you need it. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's just part of the business. When you, um, you were doing this, and, and you and I have known each other for a long, long time. We were doing it before you were the baseball coach at BYU. Then you took a decade off yeah. um, to, to coach baseball. And it, it sounds like you were doing – 35 to 50 games back in those days mm -hmm. before. Um, and then you come back full time. How hard was it to make the transition back in to college officiating after being out of it for a decade? 
Yeah, it was, you know, it's funny because Coach Pope would ask me when I was coaching, he's like, hey, can you just come up and, and officiate like our scrimmage? I'm like, there's no way I could come do a scrimmage for you right now. I, I, I wouldn't even know what I'm doing. And I was still grading games. You know, I was breaking down yeah. games for officials and, and doing that and staying close to it. Um, and by the way, I don't think if I could have done that, if I would have done that, I could have come back just because I was I had the lingo and I had seen plays. But so I started um, when I knew I was going to go back and officiate, I started working NBA, like the, the jazz training camp. Mm -hmm. Saw Danny Ainge there quite a bit. Um, but I would do that. I did the 76ers training camp when they came in. I, I did pro-am leagues up at Judge Memorial High School. I start. I worked a lot of a lot of games. And at first, those the plays were so fast, and I was following the ball, which you know, as an official, yeah. you never Can't want to watch the ball. ball right? You have your responsibilities, and if you're watching the ball like that, you're going to get fired in a hurry. So I was watching the ball, and I've got a good <laughs> buddy Gary Zelinsky who worked in the NBA for 25 years, and he came and watched me. He goes, "Hey, you're watching the ball. Watch your defender. Watch the you know, and go from defender to defender." So the play calling came back really quick. The game management part of it was, I was kind of like, I was just watching my partners and seeing what they did and when timeouts were coming. And like, they would call a timeout and I'm like, what, where's the clock? I have no idea. And, or the one and one, you know, foul. Okay, we got one and one. I'm like, oh, we're at seven fouls already? That wow. took a while. The game management part yeah. took probably a full, well, I worked last year, I worked a PK, not this that just finished but last year i worked the pk 85 i think it was for phil knight up at and that was given to me by um a guy who i i, I mean i really appreciate he's a, he's the um previous national coordinator but not until like probably thanksgiving of last year did i really feel comfortable with the game management part and and honestly it's still a work in progress but i do feel pretty comfortable now because you have to know we have a media timeout coming up first call timeout of the second half we're going to a media there's just so much. And if you don't know what's going on, you kind of look like a fool out there. So, and especially the table, they're going, Hey, that's a media timeout. And you're going, that's a 30. <laughs> no, it's a media timeout. What? Okay. <laughs> We're going. So if you know that beforehand, so all that stuff took a it little takes, bit longer than some play time calling. to get yeah. back. It, it's interesting because there is that part of the game that nobody even thinks about. Um, and as you go into a game, Officials rotate around. There's three mm -hmm. of you, and you rotate around. You're, you're on this side of the court here, yeah. and then the foul's called, and you rotate. So you're in different spots, and yeah. when you're in different spots, you look at different things. Correct. How how long does it take somebody to be proficient to know, when I'm over here, I'm looking at this, and not follow the ball? You know, it takes a long time. It really does, and it's just discipline. You have to work a lot of games. But every level you go to, if you, you go up a level, it takes a little bit different type of uh, – of discipline with yourselves like lead you're not really supposed to look up at the up but if you have a couple partners that are young you're going to take a peek up there um and so the the way we rotate is with the, the lead who's on the baseline he rotates with the ball he or she rotates with the ball so the ball goes that side you go this side it kicks the other guy out and the other guy drops down now your responsibilities change at the division one level it's a just a well-oiled machine everybody kind of knows where they're supposed to be although I was working the West Coast tournament this year. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And I'll say Vern Harris because he's a he's a really good friend yeah, of mine. He's worked ten Final Four. Yeah. So it, it what's, sad, what's sad is is when we're watching games, my wife Brenda goes, "Hey, look, honey, Vern's working this game." <laughs> yeah. And Michael Irving was working the game he last was, night. Yeah. She's like, "Hey, honey, look, it's Michael That's Irving awesome. right there." That's awesome. So, well, I, so I was reffing at Trail, which is the outside guy on who leads leads with me on the baseline, and I'm I'm kind of looking for uh, well, the lead was on the other side. I'm kind of looking for Vern because. No, C was over there. There was no lead. And I'm like, where's Vern? <laughs> he was literally right where you are, but the coach is standing between us. And I'm going, Vern, you got to get down there. And the, the coach goes, hey, Vern, pat him on the butt. You got to get down there. <laughs> so we, we Vern's do not miss, a big guy. No, Vern's a little no. guy. We do miss it sometimes. What, it's, it's fun. what is it like for an official? And we're with Mike Littlewood here on the Wise Guys, college basketball official. Just got back from officiating in the NCAA tournament. When the crowd is on you, like big time, and they decide they're going to stay on you, how do you keep that from affecting how you're going to call the game? Because you're a human being. Yeah. If you know you're right, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect you at all. Um, it, it just having thick skin. And I think being through athletics my entire life, I've, I've kind of learned, to, you know, people, it, it was a long, long time ago that I figured out that not everybody loves you. You know, when I, <laughs> when I was a coach at Alta High School, I'm like, man, I'm the best. Everybody loves me. And then, you know, you get a negative comment like, huh. I think it was a letter from a parent. Like, not everybody really loves me. And that, you know, so you kind of get... I guess just a little, you put up your armor a little bit with that. So, but when you miss a call and you know you miss it, you're like, man, I got it. It's hard to, it's hard to regroup and get back in the groove. Just 
like it is after three strikeouts, you know, or, or yeah. walking three guys in a row. It's like, how do I get this back? So it's just men mental toughness and trying to figure your way through it. Are there makeup calls? So the, the casual viewer goes, oh, that was oh, a that makeup, was a makeup call. call for the one they missed. Are there makeup calls? I mean, you try not to do that, but I would say that you want to be like-minded. So if there's a call on the other end of one end of the court that's a little bit iffy, like I, you're shooting and I hit your hand in the ball, and you, then I got to call. I've got to call the same thing on the other end of the court. And it's really not a makeup, but it's just you're trying to match calls, yeah. you know. But now, if I totally screw up a block charge call, I don't want to go down and screw up another block charge call. That's not going to be good for anybody. Yeah. What, no. what, what about technical fouls? I don't know that I've ever seen you call one. I'm mm. sure you have many times, but never in a game that I've been calling have you called one. Is that the ultimate power? Yeah. What, what's you know, if you look at it that way, then it's then you know you shouldn't be you shouldn't be doing this. I well, think I'm I not 12. a ref, and so I could like <laughs> you would call, Dave would call a lot of teams. I'm going in just talk <laughs> just teeing people out. Yeah, hey, you T. You got T. You're yeah. out of here. Uh, you know, I gave I, uh, our new supervisor really wanted us to to take care of a bench decorum, which was a you know it's a point of emphasis this year. Uh, they just they have to stay in their coaches have to stay in their box. They have to be respectful. So I probably gave 10, 10 plus or my, you know, maybe 12 technicals this year, but I view them as just another foul. It's two, it's two free throws. It's not a class, a technical foul, say a coach or a player isn't, they don't get the ball with that only a flagrant, um, or, you know, a contact dead ball or something like that, but not a, not a class. A. so it's two free throws and we play on. Right. So it's kind of the same thing as a, a shooting foul. It's looked at differently because it's usually on the head coach. Um, and he's lost his mind yeah. or something. And, and honestly, I feel like the, the technical fouls that I've given is just either he's lost his mind in a, in a moment, which I've done myself on the baseball field, so I get it. Yeah. And, or maybe we all, we all have moment. moments. Yeah. Or he wants to get a technical foul. And, and a lot of times I feel like that's the, that's the case. And, so, and sometimes it's just a reaction and you're like, no, nope, that's T. And so. Do you remember in Hoosiers, uh, Gene Hackman goes up to the official and says, kick me out. Yeah. Because he's going to have his <laughs> yeah. assistant take over and they're like, what? You kick me out. He's yeah. like, you got your reasons. Has any coach ever come up to you and said, just get me out of here? No. Um, and it, the story's too long to tell, but I know one did. Steve McLean up at Wyoming one year did. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see he Steve. He clearly doing wanted to be thrown out because he walked and he called me the, probably three or four names that I cannot say on this show right. or, any, or, 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 or any, any show. show. Uh, anyway, so he he won he wanted that, but um, nobody's ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's the most? I'm gonna add two two questions, two part. What what's your favorite game you've ever called, and then what's the most intense game you ever called? Maybe they're the same game. Well, I think the favorite was my first um, regional final. It was UConn Missouri down in Phoenix in in Glendale Stadium. So they put bleachers on half, the half court, mm -hmm. and you know there's probably thirty five thousand people there, and just a great great yeah. environment. That was probably just the most memorable. Um, man, I've had so many, so many. Just this year, I had UNLV San Diego State, and it was just a. It was just and they're a, both very good. It was this a war, year again. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. just a war, and, and um, but I had I've had a lot of those. I couldn't even name one, but this year that that one sticks out. How about that one year in the Elite Eight? You had um, Rick Pitino yelling you at you on this end of the floor, and Tom Izzo yelling at you yeah. at the other end of the floor in the same game. Yeah, that was the last game I worked before I came to BYU. Didn't know that was going to be oh, the wow. last game. And you've been in my office, and I yeah. had that ball that uh -huh. was signed by both of them, and Coach Pope was part of that because he played for Pitino. Right. So he sent the ball, and then uh, I think Coach Izzo felt like, well, I better just sign it too, and he signed it. <laughs> but they were so, you know, I worked Louisville. I, I worked Coach Krzyzewski, who, um, you know, he's he's a scary guy over there mm -hmm. on the sideline. Um, yeah, but, totally different from the persona. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I actually got a chance to work th work with them in the in the uh, 2008 Redeem team down in Vegas with the practice, you know, just their practice um, training. And isn't that when you first called, the first time you called a foul on Kobe Bryant? Uh, pr probably, <laughs> <laughs> but I did have great interaction with Kobe and yeah. I think I text you. I had, I have probably, a, I'm wait, still waiting for the uh, royalties on this, but like a one second uh, cameo appearance on, on that redeem team when Kobe was oh. going out of bounds and uh, back then the shorts were really cool to wear. That was me. And yeah, you were I in had, Vegas. I was in Vegas. Yeah. Shorts were down below my knee and you know, just a refing shirt on. But that was, that was one of the, the greatest experiences I've ever had. I took Marcus, my son. Um, down there and he he took some pictures that you weren't supposed to on like yeah. his flip phone and 
if Kobe was was asking me questions, I'm like, I don't know. I'll make something up just to keep talking. He'd ask you a basketball question like, hey, what about yeah. this? What, is this so, a foul? Is this not a foul? Exactly. So they were we were using FIBA rules, which are different than NBA rules. And he came up, and I remember the, the one specific thing. He locked my arm up, and he, he grabbed it towards him, and he goes, is this a foul in FIBA? And I said, that's a foul pretty much anywhere. <laughs> Everywhere, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I don't know if they would call it or not. But th- I just remember I gained, I don't know if we have, I gained a, a, a whole new respect for Kobe Bryant because I really wasn't a Kobe fan. Yeah. Didn't know a whole lot about his story or whatever. But anytime the USA team took a timeout or for water break, he would never take one. He would always go work on one of his patented moves that you see on TV. Every single, like for two days, he would just, he would never, and then he'd go talk to Krzyzewski about some, like, just, Game planning type stuff. Oh. It was amazing. He it was just, rel- work he relentless. Work yeah. ethic is a great yeah, way to describe just a him, new, right? new, newfound respect for for what he was all about. And they never sent you a gold medal. I wrote about your experience yeah, at Deseret.com. You can find it. no ring, no nothing, <laughs> nothing. Just just work. Not even a thanks. Not even a picture. Uh, so. Well, That's they did that, win the gold. They that did, was fun. That yeah. was the redeemed team. And yeah, and I, I feel like I was a huge part of that. So. Yeah. That's, that's very <laughs> cool stuff. Get him ready. But, hey, we're talking to uh, Mike Littlewood. We're, we're talking all basketball, but former BYU third baseman, right? Mm-hmm. There you go. And head coach Mike Littlewood. And he's on the Wise Guys with us tonight. Three WCC championships. Um, as the head coach, he led the Cougars to the 2017 NCAA tournament and named WCC Coach of the Year in 2019. Um, so here's a phil- philosophical question for you. How's playing third base a lot like life? Uh, things come at you quick, uh, I would say. You know, it's a hot corner, so there's a lot of, a lot of split decisions to make. Um, you have to show a little finesse by that slow roller. You, know, you also have to get your body and stuff and knock stuff down and, and throw a guy out. And so, yeah, there's a, you never know what's coming at you. And I think that's probably what the – at short, you just sit back there and the ground ball comes and – you go time. They got it easy. You over get there. a good hop, and you just throw it. You know, seconds even easier because <laughs> you got a shorter throw. <laughs> just kidding, but um, you know, third base, it's it could come at you hard, and, and you have to react, or they could bunt. Um, it could be a high shot. You just never know what what, what it's going to bring. And I said uh, that's probably a, a good comparison to life. When great, you're playing, great, oh, yeah. I was going to say greatest uh, third baseman of all time. Um, I love. Craig Nettles and I that's love George mine. Brett. Is it really? Yes, that's my favorite. And then every, probably anybody listening would go, who? No, who I know. That? You and I Because like, nowadays, yeah. there's some pretty good ones nowadays. Yeah. 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 Well, as you're playing that third base, it's a game and it's a college game or, or Little League or Pony League or whatever. Um, did, you, did you feel, maybe looking back now, you see how it prepared you for all the... Th- split things that are coming at you in life at the time it's just the game right i yeah. look at easton jones right now is just getting ready for his next game at yeah, byu yeah. but it's molding you for how you're going to deal with stuff oh it, it really is and it, i i was listening to you guys coming over here and uh, john was by the way was saying that his goal was that his dream was to be a, a fighter pilot and i'm like man i set my goals way too high because i put <laughs> professional baseball player on, oh. on my sheet in elementary school and and uh and unfortunately I made it, but unfortunately it was this short, short lived and my eyes were actually okay, which is even sadder yeah. because I had 20, 20 vision yeah. and still couldn't hit. But, um, I, I, I truly think that's another guy thing you guys touched on is athletics teaches you so much about life. I mean, it teaches you some negative things, especially baseball. Baseball is very, very negative. I mean, you know, the old adage is if you, if you three out of 10, you're going to make it to the hall of fame. You're the best of the best. And, and it's really what you do you're expected to field every ball and throw it across, but you don't, you know, most, yeah. most college guys are, are nine fifty. you know, they'll, they'll get 95 out of, out of a hundred, but you think about the five more than you do the 95 that you got right. And so you have to sue on that and stew on it. But the great thing about baseball is you, you play so many games, you get that opportunity to step, step back up the next day and get it going again. Unlike football where you have six days to worry about, you know, like uh, look back in, in angst or look forward and it's, and it's your choice. But all the great, all the great stuff too. Just the organizational stuff, showing up on time and being part of a team, and all the things that we could talk about um, in athletics. It, it clearly does, I think. Um, I, and that's why one of the reasons BYU has their job fair, and all the best companies are coming in looking for this at, for the athletes in this in this job fair with the athletes job fair because they have something special to offer. 
Mike yeah. Littlewood, just a couple more questions. Blaine's going to hit you up with five yeah. here in a sec. First, Uh-oh. before we do that, uh, what's the latest with the uh, with the Littlewoods, with uh, with Danny, the kids, the grandkids? What's going on? Well, there's twelve of them. And twelve, so, yeah, grandkids. Twelve grandkids. Man, nine girls, three boys. Um, Man, I was never going to let Mike get ahead of me. We, He's ahead. Yeah. Have. I'm going to catch you because Blair and Nicole down St. George. Yeah. They're going to have number twelve here. Oh yeah, you'll, you'll probably you'll probably you'll probably get us. Our two youngest haven't have, hadn't had any yet. So. Oh yeah, you're going to hit twenty. So yeah, <laughs> you're going to hit twenty. The McCanns are closing in on. Uh, we picked up nine. We're closing in on ten in July, <laughs> and then I think we're going to pass both of you before the uh, kids are done. No, yeah. that it's it's all about grandkids right now. I think you know Danny's busy with grandkids probably every day. There's mm-hmm. one of our kids is always calling. Can you watch them here and here? And so she's booked out watching grandkids, but. Um, I haven't seen Danny for probably five five months, and she's probably enjoyed that. <laughs> so. yeah, what do you do in the off season when you're home all the time? Could she even take you at home? Yeah, exactly. I I, I go hit balls a lot. So I, I and again, I've, I'm a rut- routine oriented guy. Gym, hit golf balls. You know, just have to stay busy. Yeah. And you still do some coaching, some training, and and all of that stuff. Yeah, I, I work for um, a company that. Uh, a, Chad Shepard is the general manager, and uh, it's called the Marshall Gates Foundation, where we bring in, it, it runs from June until, uh, first of June until middle of August, and I'm in player development, but we bring in 100, 120 of the best high school kids going into college, some college freshmen, and they're housed, um, they're bused to and from, they're, they have access to a 25,000 square foot facility, they play in a league out at Kearns High School, very, very competitive league, and I mean, these, these guys are going out and playing, starting it. We have guys starting at Santa Clara, starting at Stanford, starting at Cal. Uh, we had LSU's seven of their freshmen. So we get, mm. it's just, it's, it's an amazing program. And, you know, they, they probably put 750 to a million dollars in it. Really? Every single summer. Um, you know, and kids are just, and we, we get these referrals from college coaches. Say, can, can you have this kid come and, and take care of him for the summer? And my goal is to try to teach them to get ready for fall. Uh, what, what, do you, what, what can you expect? And what do you, here's some holes in your swing that you might be able to fix a little bit or, or whatever. Just tweak them a little bit in the two months because you're not going to change them. But that's, it's been great for me because that's what I love is the one thing I miss about coaching is working the guys, I mean, yeah. the relationship with the guys, but working with the infielders in the first half an hour that I would always plan for, for infield work. I miss, I miss that. Yeah. From what as a spoken as an infielder, yeah, you know, yeah, you right. know, you know what it's like. So still keeping your hand in two sports, which is really yeah, fun it's, too. It's baseball good. and basketball, which is really fun. All right, you ready to get after? Yeah, him? we'll give me five. Okay. We'll give you five questions All here. Right. Your favorite sports movie? Um, I like For Love of the Game. Ah, uh, have we had that yet? I don't know if we have or not. Uh, I saw some of it the other day. Uh, Costner's good. Yeah, yeah. it's got, it, it's a little bit. Corny, but kind of a, a my wife would call it a chick flick. Yeah, he's got some decent arm action, and so you can buy it. Yeah, and just I, I just it's kind of real. So there's a scene in there where his catcher comes out and he's throwing his no hitter. <laughs> he doesn't think he's got anything left, and the catcher is um, I, he's in all these slapstick yeah. comedies, but here he's playing a he's serious like catcher. Ferrell. Yeah, yeah a Will Ferrell colleague and. Anyway, gives him a little pep talk, and yeah. you kind of for a minute there, you're like, "Hey, we're out there on the hill with them." Yeah, we don't know what they talk about well, when they go and, out there. And in the dugout, when somebody's throwing no hitter, you you stay away from him. You, you don't say no hitter. It's in like the a dugout. kicker in football. You just don't talk to him. So I love, yeah, I just I love that part of it. It's 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 quirky and it's corny, but it's kind of real. And so yeah, I mean, at the, on the top of my head, I would I just threw that one out. Okay, I here's like a funny it. thing, real quick. I went to uh, my nephews were playing uh, state championship game, and it was AF against somebody. And uh, anyway, I was late. So I get there and I sit, my brother send me a seat in the middle of the thing and <laughs> I climb over everybody and I sit down and I look up and I, and I look up and I go, hey, has he got a no hitter? And they're all looking at me going, and then if, a, min, oh. a minute later, guy got a hit and oh, ended yeah. it. And they're sitting there going, yeah. we don't, we're not talking about that. But it was just such one of those yeah. moments where like, hey, what did I miss? Is that a no hitter? And then it ruined then it for the everyone. It's just like they're yeah. Yeah. You don't out. say that. You don't, talk, you don't talk to a guy that's having it. I realized what had happened. You don't talk to a kicker that has to kick a big kick. You don't ever talk same. to that guy. That's the same. I didn't oh, no, know that. It's like, don't, yeah. like, don't talk to that guy. Like, why would you even talk to him? Don't yeah. talk to him. <laughs> and you don't say the word shank on a golf course. <laughs> that's true. Like, it's like, you don't say, hey, yeah. I think I have the shanks. Everybody turns around. It's like, you, you just not yeah. just say shank on the golf course. That's funny. So, right. okay. Next one. Favorite singer or band? Oh gosh, um, I mean, I like Khalid. Oh, Khalid, 
That's our first. <laughs> no, I, I'm trying to think if somebody else said I that. I don't think we've had a Khalid yeah. in two years. I, I like every genre of music. I really do. So, okay. and, yeah. and I don't know lyrics, and I really don't know artists that, that well. Uh, but I know what I like. Yeah, okay. that's, that's good. That's pretty right. much everything. Khalid it is. That's good. I like it. Favorite breakfast cereal? Um, honey Nuts and Oats or whatever that one is. Honey but Bunches of Oats? Honey Bunches of Oats, yeah. The one you buy in bulk at Costco, but I don't eat a whole it, lot of it's cereal. It's scary how much we know about breakfast cereal. We, we, <laughs> we, we, like as soon we're as you throw it out there, we know exactly the one you're talking I about. I call it more like 9.30 p.m. Yeah. Uh, I, food. It's there I, for I you cereal, all the time. I eat cereal every Monday before the show. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and, it's typi- and it's typically um, Cinnamon Life. So Yeah, that's good too. Uh, yeah. Your favorite BYU moment. And it can be when you were playing, coaching. No, this is easy for me. I was sitting. I was sitting when Jimmer put up fifty six down in Vegas. Oh yeah, I was. I was was working the next game, and I was just watching him. You ref the Aztecs and who? UNLV. I think I worked the next game, or I worked the previous game. But I was on the. I was like on the second row watching that game. Yeah. So. The New Mexico game, right in the semis, is that the way the one? broke Ainge's record? Yeah, it must have been. I don't know yeah. what game. Semifinals. And he, and he only yeah. shot one free throw. I don't know what game it was, but I. It was nuts. Pretty it. awesome. People just were shaking their heads. Yeah, like it was just like just what like was me. Going on? Yeah, yeah, that Jim was. Jim night. That was fun. And hey, by the way, the national championship, Bosco to Bosco to Smith. Yeah, so he gets fifty-two it. points, and he mm-hmm. shot one free throw the whole game. Hmm. From uh, the perspective of an official, how did he not shoot like ten or twelve free throws? Because he never went inside. He shot everything from the three point line. <laughs> People would <laughs> early, in the, season, right, good early in the season for, with BYU fans kept stopping me. Why? Why does BYU? The other team always shoots twenty five free throws, and BYU shoots six. I'm like, because they shoot a bunch of threes. Yeah, like yeah. it's the nature of how they play, and nobody wanted to wrap their head around. And that's that. the way the games changed a lot. Coaches will even say that. It's funny. Coaches will find these little things like he's got more foul. They've got more foul. We only have this many fouls, and they they've got this. Or if, if they're even in fouls, then they'll point out the free throws. And if they're, you know, they'll find something. Um, but teams are teams are perimeter teams now for the most part. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's true. Okay, your favorite, uh, we asked about favorite game, but favorite officiating moment. Um, this will shock you, but I think it was when I had um, my first 5A high school championship game. George Sluga was on one side, and... Larry Maxwell was on the other. They had oh, probably wow. Legends. 70 years of high school coaching experience behind them. And this was my first my first game. And I was like, I felt like I did my first Sweet 16. I don't think my whistle is going to work. And I had a weak, weak backcourt call where the guy put his foot right on the half-court line. Didn't cost anybody the game, but I, I felt like a total idiot for calling. Oh. <laughs> just, just, you know, I, I remember those things. Um, but that was one. I was scared to death. I really was. I was scared to death. And the game went okay, I, I think. Uh, but that was one of my greatest moments. Oh, I yeah. love it. 5A, 5A championship. Yeah. Well, we're heading to the Final Four weekend of a game that means so much to so many people at all levels. And the NBA is going to play till July or whatever it is that they do. But the game can't go on without officials. And sometimes they're the bad guys. They're usually pretty good if your team won. Yeah, and the officials weren't bad because we won. <laughs> yeah. But um, – but, and, and I remember growing up, there was Moose Steubing and Irv Brown, and it felt like they yeah. were part of the show yeah. instead of yeah. the officials. I worked with I worked with Moose, yeah, yeah. But um, but but you guys have a tough job. But it is the, the the game isn't the game without the three. Used to be the two, yeah. Used to be the and two, and now the three. I guess it's the necessary evil. You know, you you can't live with them, can't live without them. You but, got you um, got you got to have them. And Dave will tell you, we'll be sitting at at our position to call a game. And I'll go, wait, hey, who's fishing in this game? And he'll read it, and I'll go, oh, no. <laughs> We're in for a long one. Like, yeah. He goes, what? And I go, D- no, I don't even want to comment on it. We're using all our notes tonight. I said, yeah. we could be here all and night. And then there's some it's where you're like, sweet, hey, look, we got the A team. Yeah. yeah. Like, there are many times when I go, oh, this is a great crew. This, this is be a okay. great crew. This yeah. is going to be a great night. It really has an impact on the game. And whenever yeah. when I look down there, and, and as long as we've been doing it, and we know who they are, when we've got a great crew, it makes the game better. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing I like, and I'll, as a as a compliment to you, because um, I've watched you ref games this year, is that um, one of your strengths is when you're on the floor, you're you're in charge, and you look in charge, you act in charge. Whether or not you're at the moment thinking you might be in charge, and I think everyone at least wants to have somebody in charge. Yeah, and I think coaches will deal with calls going this way and that as long as they know you, that you're in charge. And I think fans feel that too. Well, yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that, Dave. And I, I heard from one coach this year, we were, as officials, we were listening to a couple of coaches, but um, speak. And one of them mentioned, like, 
if you show a weakness, you're basically like swing, swinging amongst sharks. And if they see some blood or a weakness by an official, they're going to, or if us three are working, if they see the weakest link, they're going after him. And, the, and I've seen it, you know, and usually it's the younger guy. Yeah. Sometimes it's the way older guy. <laughs> uh, but th- they will find that. So you have to exude confidence. You have, without, you have to find that. Without being arrogant, um, without it's, being it's cocky, a very, a very fine, fine balance, line. right? Yep, there really, really is. Yeah, but you can't, you can't show weakness out there. Will you uh, come back on our show? I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to. And, uh, open uh, invitation as we what's, get what's through the, things. You bet. Are you going to get to a final four? Do you want to get to a final four? I'd love to. Um, in fact, I, I think I was one year away from getting there. In fact, I know I was. Um, I was told that when I got out because I had worked a couple of elite eights and, back in eleven. Yeah, it was. Uh, tw- 2012 was last, so probably okay. 13 I would have been a standby, and 14 I, I may have worked. The, the national coordinator, John Adams, actually told me that So after the fact. Um, so I feel like I was close. I don't know if I'll get back there now. Um, but I just honestly, I just want to go out every single night. I've got a different perspective on things of just getting better as an official um, because there's so much scrutiny. You want to know the rules. You have to know the rules. You, you want to make good play calls. And, and I look at myself now as a mentor to younger guys coming up and being able to help them get to the position that I'm in now to be a, to, to be a lead in a, in a, in a league, be the referee on a crew. And so that's where I'm at right now, but I would love to get back there. I'm, I'm so thankful I got back to the tournament because it's such a special thing. If you um, get back to the tournament, you're on the road to the final four. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. You know, I got one game this year. I hope to get two next year, but that's a long way away and you have to, to work Keep all your games it, yeah. and, you know, just be solid. There's when, a lot of ironing he, in between. When, There's a lot when of he, took that job, when he took the baseball job at BYU for the next couple of years, all, all the guys, and we talk about David Hall and those guys, Hey, you see our boy Mike Mike Littlewood, like, and I yeah, would always come yeah. tell you, I'd say, hey, the yeah, guys are they want tea times. All, all, exactly. Yeah, all of the all of the officials that that officiated with with Mike would always say, hey, how's our how's our guy Mike yeah. doing? Tell I would him, go see tell, a bunch of my half. Tell him we love we'd love to have him back. Yeah, so. yeah. There's there's some good guy. I miss the camaraderie. Didn't miss the travel. I miss the games, and I miss the camaraderie with the guys. Yeah. yeah. Well, That's you're fun. back in the game now, yeah. the yeah. basketball game. And say hi to your family. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks, yeah. we're thanks so grateful you come and spend some time with us. Good to see you, Mike.